Oh boy, oh boy, if it isn't that time again. 2020 is officially over, and what a year it's been. So many interesting events on YouTube and in the world itself. I think it's funny how most people make these end-of-year videos saying the last year was the worst one yet, but then 2020 comes around with a global pandemic. Guess it just shows not to jump to conclusions. Still, 2020 has been quite a good year for the Just Jargon channel. As many of you know, I'll typically do an end-of-year wrap-up like this and discuss the reception my videos have gotten from the people I've covered, and this year in particular we've had quite a packed audience. There's no shortage of stories this time. So that being said, I've decided to go for a much more relaxed approach to this year's review recap and walk you through not only how people responded, but a lot of the behind-the-scenes goings-on with the channel for anyone curious. Given how much there is to say, don't expect A-tier editing this time, but I guarantee you the year had more than enough interesting developments to keep you engaged. But first, let's tie up some loose ends. In last year's entry, I mentioned a game studio had apparently responded to a Let's Play I made of their game, one hand clapping. For no particular reason, I then sent out an email replying back to see what would happen, and surprise surprise they didn't respond. Doubt too many of you were kept on your toes from that, but I digress. Additionally, a few videos went unaddressed in last year's recap, including my video discussing the YTP MV Octagon collab, which was a group effort YouTube poop based around Jackbox's appearance in Sesame Street, discussing octagons with Elmo. The channel behind it had been shrouded in mystery until I was able to get in touch with several people behind the scenes and ask questions. To my knowledge, all of them were pleased with my coverage of it. Now usually, this is the part where I'd award myself a point, and state that for every bad reaction I'll lose points, and that if my score is negative by the end, I'll be forced to be subjected to a punishment. But let's face it, if you've seen the other two, you'd know it's rigged for me to lose every time, so I'll just skip it. Link to the punishment poll is listed below. I also neglected to mention that last year's video discussing the changes to the Cool Cat movie, and featuring Adam from YMS, was received positively by Adam himself. And although I can confirm Derek Savage knows of my existence, I'm fairly confident he wants nothing to do with me after that. <laughs> One other honorable mention in terms of responses would be Joe Samuels. If you're unaware who he is, I wouldn't blame you since he only got a sentence worth of screen time in a video. Literally. Literally one sentence. In fact, I don't think he even got that. He was one of 10 people I covered in my Underrated Channels video in April of 2019, and his account had been deleted and archived by another in the time since. Number 4, Joe Samuels. Go watch this channel yourself. All I'm gonna say about it is, praise Joe Samuels. Shame, because the content was actually pretty funny and unique. I'd recommend you check it out for yourself. I'll even link it. The basic premise is that Joe Samuels created the universe, but the evil Jeff Bezos took away all his power, and he has to go on a journey to reclaim it. Weird, I know, but it's good. Hello, my loyal subjects. It is I, Joe Samuels, the creator of the universe we both hold so dear to us. Today, I'm going to be telling you how you can spread the word of me, the almighty creator. But first, let's start at the beginning. Two hundred and thirty-nine years ago, I got bored and created the universe. I created a wife. I gave society everything it would need to have a happy and fulfilling existence. And earlier this year, Joe actually reappeared and approached me in a Discord VC, telling me he liked the video and that he'd quit because he got bored of the channel. It's too bad, but that's about all there is to it sometimes. But now, going into 2020, we have quite a few interesting projects to discuss. Starting off strong with my Decline of the Angry Video Game Nerd video. My god. The reception to that video was probably the most negative I've ever received. But for a very odd reason. Most of the comments seemed to be AVGN fans defending James Rolfe, the channel's creator, but in actuality I never said anything bad about him. In fact, the video is defending James from the ridicule he's faced from the opposite side of the fandom, who's labeled him as a sellout. In my opinion, this was unfair since while I do agree the channel has declined due to him having a smaller part in his own content, I think the changing landscape is more to blame. By requiring him to make more videos to keep afloat, YouTube has spread his attention too thin, forcing him to take a back seat and let others help. And to many, this has resulted in a quality drop. Oddly, when I created my video, I was already going in expecting a heavy amount of backlash, but for the exact opposite reasons. Instead of comments flooding in about me giving excuses for James and that it's all his fault, instead I got people who were mad at me for insulting him, which I never actually did. I think this is because I spent the first few minutes of the video discussing Cinemasker's history so I could show the decline over time, and people didn't make it far enough to see what I was actually referring to, so I think they just assumed it was an attack on James. But this isn't me taking guesses. A large portion of the comments prefaced themselves off by saying they didn't watch the video. But it wasn't just audiences who got annoyed. Around a week after it premiered, I was told that several Cinemasker cast members were made aware of it, and not pleased. I don't wish to smear them, so I'm not going to be too specific with who they are, but if you're curious, no, it wasn't James or Mike. Mike and I talked about it, and 
he'll be leaving the channel to focus full time on his streaming. As far as I know, they never saw it. But to be fair, neither did the other members who were angry. <laughs> one did watch it, however, and he messaged me directly, which led us to talk with one another. He even graciously offered his knowledge on the channel should I ever make a sequel. I came back to him nearly a year later during the creation of my Cinemaskers Lost Videos video, but unfortunately he walled up when I asked him why Minecraft with Gadget was reposted, which was my main pressing question. And up until recently, it was by far the most popular piece of Cinemasker Lost Media. But I say was because in May of 2020, Mike chose to re-upload all three to the second channel, for no apparent reason. Unfortunately though, it seems that bridge has been burnt by even asking. Then there's the two videos I made on The Office's YouTube channel. They're some of the most pointless videos I've ever made, but I think it's funny they exist. Both talked about how the official YouTube channel for the popular series The Office had its verification tick removed due to a quirk in the guidelines, and that it was returned shortly after my first of the two premiered. Something which may not have been a coincidence. It's pretty tinfoil hatty to say, but maybe there's a chance me mentioning it did something. But I really doubt it. Still, it's the closest I could get to a response from a channel like this. Next, we have my third entry to the Staxolotl trilogy. <laughs> In each, I'll playfully feud with fellow YouTuber Staxolotl, a series which is kind of odd in retrospect since Stax essentially quit the site prior to the release of the most recent part. Still, he liked it and Just a Robot even responded to a small joke made about him in the opening segment. And in case you're curious, the joke was that Stax and Jar are similar in the type of content they make. Then of course, there's my Leafy Victims video posted on Leap Day. And fittingly so, since it would leap up and become my most popular video, bordering on a million views. In it, I discuss several figures who Leafy used as material in his older content, with the most prominent being Stomini, Mr. Black Darkness 666, and Devin Sweeney. And the video ended with a teaser for a separate video discussing another one of these figures known as Joseph A276. Number 10, Joseph A276. Joseph A276 is a true legend. His equally tragic and hilarious past stems farther back than most would ever imagine, though even his name has been largely forgotten. Most know him as The Beast. Joseph A276 here. You want a rant from The Beast? You're gonna get a rant from The Beast. Of the people mentioned, only Mr. Black Darkness responded, most likely because my video was very positive towards him, since I genuinely believe his content is good and want to collab with him somehow in the future. Unfortunately, his comment accepting my offer was sent to the Held for Review section, which prevented me from noticing it for over six months. I'm still kicking myself that I let that happen, but the two of us are in contact now so the collab can still happen. As for the other channels mentioned, none of which responded, but in regards to Devin Sweeney, who popped back up several times and posted videos that would end up getting deleted, I archived them in a downloadable folder on the Wayback Machine. Now they're viewable publicly. But as far as I know, he's been completely off the internet ever since the creation of the video. The same, however, cannot be said for Stomedy, who in particular would take a very interesting path in the following months. He'd had some major ups and downs, several of which I mentioned in my video, like how his account was once rebranded to impersonate an ASMR channel, and how he had wiped his backlog and re-uploaded videos slowly with altered titles to further mislead viewers. He did this several times. Content purges and name changes became a monthly occurrence, and one such name he took after the release of my video was Cracked Broken Screen Repair, after a video of him pretending to fix a broken TV screen became his most popular upload. I guess he was trying to cash in on it. Despite his odd choices, one that no one would expect was that several months later, Stomedy would delete his entire channel outright along with many of his social media accounts and for no apparent reason. To this day, he hasn't resurfaced online as far as we know. It's strangely fitting given the fact that Leafy himself would end up getting his channel deleted as well. This isn't a where are they now type video and I've already discussed this topic a lot so I'm not going to linger on it, but I can't help but find it weird how many major figures saw a downfall around this time. But Levy's in particular was especially odd, because when I touched on the subject briefly in my How YouTube and Commentary Made Each Other Worse video, its release fell on the same day as Leafy's Twitch ban. Happy 9-11. Prior to all of this though, I'd made one other video on Leafy specifically called Leafy's Lost Videos, and I can't tell if this aged amazingly or horribly. I'd collected as many archived videos as I could from his Minecraft past and from deletions occurring in his prime, and went over the meaning behind them all. Fittingly, at the end, I even said I thought his channel was at risk. Although after his deletion, I tracked down a complete archive of his channel on Google Drive, then grabbed its contents and merged them together with the missing videos I'd already collected, and put it all up on archive.org for people to access. But other than seeing my icon cameo in one of his videos on a commentary channel tier list, Leafy never responded to anything I made about him. Surprise, surprise. 
Though curiously, I would discover that Leafy's last editor, who I'm pretty sure wishes to be unnamed, was a pretty big Just Jargon fan, and even said he took inspiration from my content. It's funny, because if that's the case, I think there is legitimate evidence to support the cycle of plagiarism. Now as for the other people in my YouTubers Lost Videos series, I haven't gotten a response from any of them as far as I know. Even Mumkey. But that doesn't mean I don't have some updates on these topics. First off, in the Shane Dawson video, I mentioned I'd been unable to grab any of his older content because the Wayback Machine wasn't loading videos at the time. And I have the names and thumbnails of some that were recoverable. But emphasis on were. Because the Wayback Machine recently went through a massive change that resulted in many of the actual videos on the pages they'd saved no longer being viewable. In other words, you can access the watch page but not play them. Or even download them. And unfortunately, at the time of doing the research, I didn't have a downloader that could grab videos from here, so I didn't get them in time. Most of these went missing from his purge in January of 2018, and I tracked them down in March of 2019 just as Google Plus was being shut down, and the links preserved on it were about to be lost. But that error has since been patched, and I managed to grab quite a lot. On top of that, Shane has been secretly removing more content behind the scenes. He took down I Hate My Selfie short film months later and deleted a lot of his character channels, with the biggest of which having 300,000 subscribers and was taken down midway into the creation of my video. Shane himself has even started becoming active again in early December, so who knows where this will all go. Still, I put up all the content of his that I collected into an archive.org folder like I did with Devin and Leafy's lost videos. And I did the same thing with every other figure I talked about in this series. Then there's my Lost Videos video discussing Mumkey. It talked about the content that was still missing following the deletion of his main channel over two years ago in December of 2018, and how a folder on uTorrent was uncovered by a dedicated user trying to track everything down. The folder supposedly contained a complete archive of everything, but couldn't be opened. So I would end my video with a call to viewers to help crack it, but I would soon discover it's not that simple. The folder had zero seeders, which essentially means that no one was housing the content, and the folder is defunct unless the original uploader embeds the files again. Unfortunately, no such thing has happened and it's still impossible to open. Mumkey never responded, like I said, but in searching out his older content, I did find a lost stream where he watched a short film contest submission of mine that was later re-edited and put up on the main channel as a review. Apparently he liked it. Uh, it was competent. That's more than we can say for most of the ones we've watched so far. As for Mumkey himself, very little has changed since the prior year. He's continued uploading on his Simeon Jimmy account that was once his Countdown to Demonetization channel, and posted a somewhat regular frequency as well as on his Mumkey and Big Show gaming channel, and every now and then on Twitch. And on top of creating several new series like The History of Humanity, he's also started appearing on podcasts again with friends, like Is It Kino with Florian, and a new one known as Trash Rats with Rusty Cage and Reactor, which served as a rebranding of his State of the YouTube podcast and even is housed on the same channel. In terms of his well-being since the drama, though, I'm not entirely sure. But I remember watching one of his gaming channel videos and hearing him mention that he was off the antidepressants that put him in the manic state we saw during the drama videos last year. So, I, I stopped taking the depression medication, like, months ago, and I said, you know what, fuck this, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna do, what, CBD instead, why not? He's also gotten a normal job of some kind to supplement his income, which appears to be working. I've been slowing down a little bit on video production because I'm doing, you know, other things. I'm like trying to make money from things that aren't the internet like a responsible person does. Not sure what the future holds, but I wish him well, and I'm still bitter at the site itself for what it did to him. He made mistakes, sure, but the whole situation stemmed from the deletion and should never have happened at all. It irks me even now. Especially because, even after all these years, I still will never forget that he got me my first thousand subscribers when I sat with no recognition whatsoever. I had 90 dormant subs from when I was a gaming channel in 2013, and after a shoutout on Twitter and a lucky break in the algorithm, I was able to reach 1200 that month. But now this situation may be rather similar to another. A few weeks ago, I discussed a YouTuber known as The Harry Gold Show, who I found with 230 subscribers and felt was vastly underrated. I discovered him through a parody skit he did using James Lee's editing style while covering a Neil Cesariga song. Because of its high quality, the fact that he works in the animation industry, and is Australian, I compared him to James Lee a lot, especially since they both own underrated channels. But the comparisons don't end there. After my video premiered, I would end up discovering that the two actually went to the same university. At separate times, but still. I I swear that place is the editor's equivalent of the school in Death Note that's tasked with raising the best detectives in the world. And then there's the old missing content that's confirmed to exist based on a discussion tab post. I did ask him about it, and apparently it was just a standalone school project, so we're not missing much. Now as you know, I quite like James Lee and his content, and seeing someone with similar capabilities go unnoticed was genuinely infuriating for me. I've watched for these last few years as YouTube has gotten worse and worse, actively forcing out or outright suspending the people who
whose content I once enjoyed. And even those who don't get driven off are eventually forced to change to such a degree that they lose their charm. And as cringy as it may sound, it does upset me seeing people who once entertained me even as late as my teenage years be swept away like it's nothing. That's why I wanted to do something for Harry, because I enjoy his channel and can't say the same about very many people anymore. And it was fucking amazing seeing his numbers grow when my video premiered. On my first check, his 230 had become 600, and I swear I spent most of that day refreshing the tab, watching it grow to the point where I may have been more excited about it than even he was. By the end of that night, he'd reached a thousand subscribers, and I posted a celebration video on my second channel the following day, set to sweet victory. I know shoutouts don't do much, but for someone like Harry, whose channel is so quality over quantity in its approach, he's at so much of a disadvantage to the people who crank out crap that I think it's better than nothing. And in an oddly poetic way, I think things have come full circle, and Harry had a similar solution play out as I did with Mumkey all that time ago. And it does genuinely warm my heart that I was able to make that happen for someone, since I know firsthand how good it felt when it happened to me. I just hope Harry can run with it and become the YouTube king we all know he can be. We've talked a bit since, and you probably won't have seen the last of him on this channel. I do want to collab with him in future projects at some point when the opportunity comes, and plus, he was gracious enough to make me a video watermark, which is the clickable icon overlaid at the bottom right-hand corner of my videos. You can probably see it right now. Originally, I messaged him and asked if I could commission art, but he was so happy about my video that he insisted on doing it for free, and I can't thank him enough. Keep being awesome, Harry. And then there's his college buddy, James Lee himself. As you may know, I made a video discussing the Lost sequel to his Tarboy 2 animation from 2009. At the time, this was his biggest claim to fame, and is still how a portion of the internet knows about him today. After he'd posted an explanation of why the sequel was cancelled in the original Tarboy's description, it got me curious what existed of it today. And when I was able to get in touch with James himself, I eventually learned that only one of several major cutscenes was completed, on top of a trailer which showed some amount of gameplay. I played clips from these as a surprise at the end of my video, but what many don't know is that these are all the clips that exist, period. I played them out of order, cut up, and without the music at James's request due to licensing, but what you see is all that's there. And me showing it was always intended to be an unveiling rather than a teaser for something bigger. But that being said, despite the fact that I do tend to release lost content, I'm not putting up the unedited cut of Tarboy 2, at James's request. And in terms of how he responded, he quite liked it. But the more interesting response was the YouTube algorithm itself. Now, I don't want to dip into conspiracy theory territory, but after that video was posted, something odd happened. James Lee's channel had been sitting flatlined for some time. He'd posted a video simply called Winner three days prior, which boosted his views for a bit, but starting the day after my video, his channel saw an uptick in views and subscribers, which steadily grew as the month progressed, and began to see exponential growth on the 20th. James posted another video later on the 22nd, and going active again increased his views even more and sent his channel into a rebound. The video was titled Breaking Up with Adobe, and to this day sits with over 1.1 million views. But if you look at the numbers, he was getting way more views that month than that. I remember messaging him, saying congrats on the new growth and asking where it all came from. Turns out, for seemingly no reason at all, the original Tarboy hit a second wave of views that reached an additional million, starting on the 7th, the day after my video. Now, I'm obviously not claiming that my video directly added to it, since it itself had around 30,000 views at the time, but it's just odd to me. Tarboy was not a hot topic back then, and as far as I know, nobody else was discussing it. Then, a day after I do, the video goes viral a second time? It may sound far-fetched, but I genuinely believe there's some chance that an algorithmic quirk was triggered that gave the video a second wind of popularity. And my god, if that's true, what a fucking awesome chain of events. The month of June 2019 would prove to be James's biggest growth period ever, even beating out the month of the PewDiePie shoutout contest. And this time it was from viewers directly subscribing based on content they'd seen of his rather than being instructed by someone else. As I said, shoutouts can be better than nothing, but this is by far preferable. Even if my video didn't cause it, something clearly happened with Tarboy that month and it couldn't have happened to a better person than James. It felt good seeing content like his went out naturally, for once in what felt like too long for channels like him. Next, though, let's talk about a little-known channel called Voorhees the Greek. If you don't remember, he's the person who paid for my $100 Patreon tier that included a review request, and he asked me to review his YouTube channel. Unfortunately, I waited too long, and by the time I got around to making the video, he'd long since gone inactive. I messaged him, but unfortunately had no luck getting a response. So, I reviewed the channel attached to a video he'd sent me way back when. After I reviewed it, the channel went up around 30 subs or so, and it was enough to get his attention. He came back and posted a return video, saying that he'd actually intended for me to review a different account, and forgotten that he'd paid me to do it in the first place. I did actually mean for Just Jargon to review a different channel. Although, in all fairness, I forgot about that whole thing until, uh... Until today, when I googled my, uh... My 
username and I saw the video and they, uh, I was confused and then I remembered I paid him money to review my channel. So, um, if you want to see the channel that I meant, I'll comment it down below. And if you want to see that disgusting garbage on that channel, then, uh, feel free. <laughs> it's really fucking awful. It's really awful. You don't want to watch it. You really don't fucking want to watch it. It's gross. And stupid. He then commented the channel he had intended for me to review for those curious. And to make sure he gets his money's worth, let's take a look at it right now. Unfortunately, his Twitter's gone today, so who knows if he'll ever see this. Oh, it's Lil Greek Fury. I thought it was Lil Greek Furry. So this is the channel. Uh... Oh god. Let's, let's, this one's five seconds long. Gun Advocate Destroys Conservative. Let's just look at it. Five seconds. What could happen? Does anybody here want to sell me a gun? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Spaghetti-o meme god. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, skip. <coughs> Let's watch one more. Vlog 5, I'm back. Face reveal. Hey. I was filming another vlog. Uh, so it's been a while. Like, maybe like a month or two. Um, so, like, my suicide attempt failed. Like, in the last one. I did, it didn't <laughs> die. Okay. A great way to start off your I'm back vlog. Well, there we go. I'm giving this one a six out of, and let's actually just comment that. Comment that right. Oh, whatever, 61 out of 10 it is. Okay, now let's move on to some of the weirder ones. The JonTron reacts to anime video. This upload of mine has a very strange backstory. I was actually gonna make it in May of 2018, and I was sitting on the script for that long. But since the video focuses on discussing anime footage with JonTron clips spliced in, and specifically emphasizes anime trap footage, I decided to wait until I could get a fitting cameo. I went to Dimitri Monroe, the internet's most well-known guy who looks like a girl. But unfortunately, he ended up being busy and I was forced to get someone else to fill his role. Because as you may have noticed, even though the video has me address Dimitri by name, the voice of the person you hear isn't him. The voice is actually someone named Slimy, who's compared to Dimitri often since they look similar. Slimy seemed to like the video, I guess, so it came out good in the end? Then there's the Weird World of Jargon Parodies video. As you know, a lot of alternate jargon-related Twitters have appeared over the years, like Jargon Love and Jargon Hate, Neutral Jargon, and Jargon Trap among countless others. As I thought, acknowledging their existence caused more to pop up, and even though I finished the video by saying I don't think I'd ever talk about them again in a standalone upload unless something big happened, I think mentioning things here is the perfect compromise to a sequel. The new accounts to emerge were Jargon Alpha, Jargon Omega, just Jargon's father, and Sunderay Jargon. Overall, I must say I'm liking the creativity here. Sunderay Jargon was deleted pretty fast, and Just Jargon Alpha went inactive just as quickly, but Just Jargon's father is pretty funny, especially since I gave the guy who runs it some real info to make the jokes hit a bit closer to home. And Just Jargon Omega is cryptic. It even went the full mile by making edited Twitter videos too. They're pretty good. As far as the odds and ends with review responses go, there was one more, and I really didn't expect it. Apparently, someone I knew went to school with the random brony commentary channel whose video I ran into in my Unwrapping the Unlisted video. In it, I use a site that catalogs user-submitted unlisted videos by clicking the Random Page button. One of the people I found was a brony using character stills retrofitted from MLP screenshots. Funnily enough, it took me so long to get around to editing the video, the brony commentary had been deleted entirely before my video mentioning it even came out. I can't really blame him, it definitely wasn't the best. But that's all for the little stuff. As you know, I made several big documentaries that have been passion projects I've had on the back burner for literal years. The biggest being Josefe276, no pun intended. This was an hour and 20 minute documentary based on a man named Joseph Strickland who would regularly make rants on relationships, women, and swag, oddly enough. The video details Joseph's entire life and experiences online, and much of the information was derived from posts on Kiwi Farms as the drama unfolded. 
The Kiwi Thread did take notice of my video, as did Parquet, the Thread's creator and arguably the leading expert when it comes to Joseph's history specifically. We have talked since in private, although I'm going to refrain from mentioning exactly what was exchanged because I want to make a dedicated follow-up video to the Joseph documentary discussing it all there. So if you're curious, just look forward to that, I guess. And no, Joseph himself did not respond, just in case you're curious. But in one of the shots of the original Joseph documentary, I show a screenshot of a video called Listen Up Ladies. Listen up ladies, oh my god. That I allude to being a commentary video made off of Joseph's most well-known upload, the problem with girls and what they should do. And the user who posted it was a guy known as Cheese Man. A small YouTuber who, while disconnected from Joseph's history, is actually incredibly ingrained in my history. I first ran into him in mid-2018 when recording the five-part subscriber review special to celebrate hitting 1k. He'd made a video discussing movie unleashers that I saw in my sidebar, which I clicked on a whim and spent 30 minutes talking about while still recording. I remember saving the footage and eventually releasing it nearly two years later on April 1st, 2020 as a second channel video. Just for a joke. He had a little over 50 subs at the time of the original recording, but what I didn't know is that six months later I'd run into him yet again during the Jello Apocalypse drama, wherein this YouTuber posted a video titled Vote, trying to sway his audience politically. The video was taken down due to backlash, but the person to archive and re-upload it was none other than Cheeseman himself, which I discovered when I sought it out to upload my own video on the topic. And funnily enough, I think he was actually the one to give me the idea for making Review Recap in the first place, with his My Last Video Of series, which is similar in what it talks about. Technically, since my video on him was released this year, even though it was a shitpost on the second channel that I filmed two years ago, I suppose it counts, he liked it, though was a bit surprised to say the least. He even later reached out again when the Joseph documentary premiered after seeing his video featured. Today, Cheeseman has over 1,000 subscribers and even made a video that went viral about the D's Nuts guy. It was pretty decently edited too, but despite this he hasn't uploaded since, and I'm still unsure why. Then there's the Spetchy video. Spetchy, for those of you who don't know, is a storytime animator who became infamous in mid-2018 while the genre was blowing up. Despite not being a big documentary, really not big, this video came out sandwiched between my two longest videos. And while the Joseph doc started to blow up in the algorithm and was close to becoming one of my biggest videos, I released the Spetchy video to fill time while I prepped my next big project. But because of this timing, it blew up as well, which I wasn't expecting. The video was nothing more than a where are they now type thing where I essentially said that Spetchy had changed her ways and that a lot of the criticisms levied at her in the first place were because she was used as an example for people criticizing storytime animators. Her flaws were very minor in comparison to other controversial figures, but she was the perfect embodiment of complaints that people already had with the genre, which is why things happened the way they did. But strangely, despite there being well over 100 videos discussing her issues, not a single person had touched back on the situation. So I decided to and talked about the positive turnaround that had ensued. Later, I found out Spetchy had posted a video of her own, mentioning that she'd stumbled across a video made about her. She never mentioned it by name, but said the comments were positive. And since mine was the most recent one to come out about her, and the only one that talked about her in a favorable light, she was probably talking about mine. I read the comments on a video about me, and, and they were nice, the comments were nice. And you're like, why the fuck are you crying? Cause like... I thought everyone hated me. And I know that sounds so stupid. This video would go on to get deleted later on, but I saved it because I hold on to any video that can make me cry. Then, following the release of my Spetchy video, came the project I'd coveted for so long. The Movie Unleashers Documentary, or How YouTube Drove an Animator Insane. This video was by far one of the most important projects I have ever put out, and probably ever will. Dane Prosnick, or Movie Unleashers, is a guy who consistently has been wronged by YouTube and audiences alike. He aspires to be a filmmaker, but was forced into animation when his friends stopped wanting to film with him, and his limited art style made many brush off his work, even though many of his videos have real quality to them. He made many of them parodies so they would have outside appeal, but doing so would end up getting him lumped in with infamous parody channels like Futuristic Hub, even when he tried doing his best to stand out and produce effortful content. Videos would see attention, but more often than not it would be his filler videos that he'd create about popular franchises to fill gaps between larger projects, when they would take months to make. And even when his passion projects did see exposure, it was always flooded by children asking him to parody more trendy games and movies. This was to the point where when he tried to expand into all original stuff, the only engagement was from fans telling him to just stop and parody something they liked. And as this wore on over years, Dane's patience and sanity began to thin. 
We'd been friends ever since 2016 and I watched a lot of this play out on Twitter. And it was then I decided to make a documentary about him, before I even had my own channel. But I knew this was something I wanted to commit to, so I waited. I waited for so many years until finally, the perfect opportunity arose and now it's one of my most popular videos. And the reception was amazing. People were finally paying attention to Dane and giving his channel a real chance. People were finally looking past the surface level and hearing out his story. And that's all I ever wanted. Dane, on the other hand, was beyond worried. Having new eyes on him stressed him out beyond belief as he struggled to realize that this was an audience that didn't hate him. And when those feelings passed, he finally realized he'd gotten the viewership he always wanted, even if it was just for a short time. Afterwards, he released an update video telling viewers what he was up to currently, saying he was in the middle of producing a movie, and that YouTube hadn't been that big of a priority for him in recent months, simply because he'd written it off. Following that, though, Dane and I would collab in a series of tier list videos on both of our channels to ride off the hype. We ranked Dane's animations on his, and discussed the PewDiePie shoutout contest winners over on mine, which was another video that many of those involved responded to, including Surreal Entertainment, a 3D animator, Dylan Locke, a musician who did work for PewDiePie at one point, and Wavy Websurf, a commentator who discusses internet history. All of which liked it. But back on Dane, following the collabs as traction on the documentary began to die down, I would create a follow-up to it discussing my friendship with him and the personal history I had with his channel so people got a better idea as to how much it meant to me. Something which Dane responded to quite nicely as well. He even opened up a Discord server to chat with viewers, being more social with his community for the first time, and was pleasantly surprised to see many people who had joined had come to understand him through the documentary, though a portion of the server still echoes the same words as his comment section. Even still, things with his channel have improved as well. After everything was settled, he created several more videos. Two parodied popular up-and-coming games at the time, Fall Guys and Among Us, both of which did insanely well, and were labors of love with unique animation that he hadn't just made for the sake of filler. He also made a sequel to his Good Dinosaur parody from 2015, after seeing the original gain a spike of views for seemingly no reason, which he calls attention to and teases the viewers for. I was also surprised that you, the viewer, are watching a Good Dinosaur parody in the year 2020! Why? But on top of everything, he had a tweet go viral where he renamed Mr. Beast videos with joke tiles to fit thumbnails, which actually started when he and I were sending edits back and forth to one another on Discord for fun, and he decided to put them up on Twitter to show fans. Long story short, Mr. Beast saw, retweeted it, and it was acknowledged by a lot of large YouTube personalities like Grande and Fainted. But funnily enough, this wasn't the only Mr. Beast related encounter that occurred this year. As a lot of you may know, I posted a video of my own in June of 2019 about Mr. Beast, and to this day I still view it as my favorite video. I definitely worked the hardest in this one than any other, and was always upset that it peaked at 5,000 views when it came out. But strangely, over the course of this past year and a half, it's nearly reached 300,000. And ironically, is my most hated video since most viewers took it seriously, but still, I'm just glad it spread so far. More interestingly, I'm pretty sure Mr. Beast has seen it. You see, a while ago, my girlfriend Mango, who runs the channel Neon Caffeine, decided to make a video about Mr. Beast as well. She brought in a lot of personal friends of his to discuss their experiences with him, and one was upset after having been ghosted by him. When Mango announced all this, Mr. Beast caught wind of it and reached out to the guy. Apparently, he deleted all his social media and Mr. Beast simply couldn't find him. The two made up and he was so grateful to Mango that he followed her and said he was looking forward to her video. I mention all of this because I myself appeared in the video with a joke segment I made specially for it. Another YouTuber, called Just Jargon, who made a video called Where Mr. Beast Really Gets His Money, which I'll link in the description below, had this to say. Nah, dip, it's fake. The video is a joke, yet people are getting so butthurt over it because people on the internet are stupid. It's obviously fake and a joke, yet what's wrong with you? Nothing's really been the same since then. 
I had to run because obviously he won't let me live after this. But I beg you, all of you, don't fall for his lies. It's not too late. Evil dictators can fall, and one day his reign of terror will end. Six Semper, Mr. Beast. I found out Mango DM'd Mr. Beast directly, explained its context, and linked my original video to him. So who knows? <laughs> but in terms of responses, that's pretty much everything. 2020 has certainly been a wild ride. Not just in the world, but for this channel as well. And acknowledging all these events has really made me realize that. But it's time to move forward. Here's to more insanity in 2021. <laughs>